Hi, and welcome to module 5 of video lecture 4 covering the derivative of the exponential, exponential function. So previously we covered two rules of differentiation. One, the derivative is a linear operator, and two, the chain rule. And we also looked at how to differentiate one type of function, one class of function, polynomials, and considered the rule from that, to do that, the power rule. Now we're going to do another class of function, exponentials. We call it an exponential, it takes this form, where e is the base of the natural logarithm. Now, the great thing about the differential derivative of an exponential is we saw in the previous module, the derivative of e of the x equals e of the x. It could not be simpler to remember, right? Nothing changes. Now, how can that be the case? To understand how it works, that's a pretty quick um, little, little, little proof type thing. But before we get to that, um, we have to define an exponential in a little more, a little different fashion right, than before. There are actually several ways to define an exponential. I mentioned a couple in the textbook. Here we'll look at one. The exponential is a sum from n equals zero to infinity of x to the n over n factorial. So it's, it's, so it's a series, an infinite series. The first term is 1 plus x plus 1 half x squared plus 1 um, 6 x cubed plus dot, dot dot forever. Now why do we need that? We need that to figure out the derivative. And it turns out to be pretty straightforward given this. So let's begin. We want the derivative of e to the x. So again, we use that same definition of a derivative. e to the x plus h minus e to the x divided by h. Now, that's equal to the limitation with the zero. We can, now remember, e to the x plus h equals e to the x times e to the h. If you forgot about that, go back to lecture two and check out some of the rules for functions. That means we can pull out e to the x from both terms here and here and get e to the x, e to the h minus one over h, right? Because all we've done is take this one, this term right here, first term, split it up like this on top, and then pull out e to the x from both terms, distribute, distribute them, undistribute them, I guess. Um, but now, well, e to the x has nothing to do with h, so I can pull it out of the limit completely. So e to the x out front, and now the limit as h goes to zero of e to the h minus one over h. Now, if this thing, if this limit is equal to one, we're done, because this is the e to the x we wanted. How can we show that? Well, this, over here, if we plug in this expansion for u to the x, we get 1 plus h plus 1 half h squared plus dot dot dot, dot minus 1 over h. Well, the 1's cancel. All the higher order terms in h when divided by h in the bottom, leave you with at least h, or an h of higher power, h squared, h cubed, and so on. In the limit, those go to zero in the exact same way we, we did for the, for the um, proof of the power rule, leaving only h over h. h over h is one. The limit of one as h goes to zero is one. So this gives us e of the x as required. So I see that the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x. Great. The nicest derivative possible. Now, what if we want to be a little more general, right? It's fine that e to the x is equal to, the derivative of that is equal to e to the x, but what about the derivative of something else to the x? Well, let's just try that. e to the x, where a is some constant, what's that? Okay. Well, 
one way to get at this is to write this in a little different fashion. Now, we know that e to the natural log of x equals x because e and the natural log are inverse functions. Again, if you don't remember that, you can go back to lecture 2, chapter 3 of the textbook, and I'll remind yourself of that fact. That coefficient identity, e and the natural log of x, are inverse functions, and thereby, when one is composed with the other, it equals x. Now, by that same logic, e to the natural log of a to the x equals a to the x. Again, they're inverse functions, so when you compose them with each other, you get back whatever's in the middle. Now, natural log of a to the x equals x natural log of a. This is, again, a property of the natural log. And if you, if you don't remember this, you can go back to chapter 3 of the book, lecture 2 of the videos, and check that out. So putting this all together, we get that e to the x natural log of a equals um, a to the x. Okay. Now why do we bother doing that? Well, we can use the chain rule, because now, if you note, this term over here is a composite function. That's that g equal e to the x and f of x equal x natural log of a, where a is some constant. Then a of x here equals g of f of x. Okay. So far so good. We've set up this, this function as a composite function allowing us to use the chain rule. So we use the chain rule in the exact same way we did in the previous module. So first step, u equals f of x equals x natural log of a. Okay. g of u, g prime of u, is just e to the u, because the derivative of e to the anything is just e to the anything back again. f prime of x, now natural log of a is just a constant, so f prime of x times natural log of a is just the constant times the derivative of x. The derivative of x is 1. So this is just the natural log of a. Now we can put back in f of x back in for u. That equals e to the x natural log of a which we can replace back again with a to the x, because again, the same thing. And the last step, we multiply this and this to get that the derivative of a to the x of dx equals e, sorry, a to the x times f prime, which is the natural log of a. And that is a general, um, rule for differentiating exponentials. That's it. So if you have e to the x, the derivative is e to the x. If you have a to the x for some other a that's not e, you get e to the x back again times the natural log of a. And you can check if a is equal to e. The natural log of e is just 1, so this term goes away. So it works out just fine for all possible values of a. And you can just remember this one if you want. Although, frankly, e to, the x, e to the x comes up a lot more often than a to the x does, for reasons we'll get into. So there you go. Just to get used to this a little more, let's do a couple of examples that'll help us also use the chain, chain rule a little better. We did e to the x squared in the last module. Let's try a little more complicated one. Let's try x to the third minus 7x plus 1. Now, you might think this is pretty complicated, but again, chain rule solves it for us. We'll make g of x equal to e to the x. We'll make f of x equal x cubed minus 7x plus 1. Again, as before, g prime of u will just be e to the u back again. f prime of x will be 3x squared from the first term minus 7 from the second term plus zero from the third term, and that's it. G prime of f of x 
we equal e to the x cubed minus 7x plus 1. And all told, putting put them together, you get e to the x cubed minus 7x plus 1 times 3x squared minus 7 is a derivative of the thing on top. In fact, this is a general, we can skip some steps in the future because if you notice, all these derivatives are the same type. You get back the original function, the original exponential, and you multiply it times the derivative of the thing of the x, of the thing in, in the power, right, where the power is. So we can skip some steps here. If we have, for instance, e to the square root of x um, minus 1 over x, pretty complex. But again, the derivative will be the same thing back again. times the derivative of the thing inside, which if you recall from previously, um, from previous module was one half x to the negative one half plus one over x squared. That's it. You can do any kind of complicated exponential by using the chain rule combined with the derivative of the exponential itself, which again is pretty straightforward. That's it. Uh, that's it for this one. The next module will cover the logarithm. Thank you very much.